My readings are both from the epistle to the Romans, Paul's letter to the church at Rome. I'll begin in chapter 5, verse 6, and then I'll skip some really, really good stuff there at the end of chapter 5 to go to the beginning of chapter 6. So that's on page 1130 in the regular print Bibles and 1713 in the large print. So beginning in verse 6 of chapter 5, Paul writes this to the church. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless... Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, Shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In the beginning of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin." Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, in my sermon title, I left out a really important phrase because when I first typed it out, I was just going to put parts of it so you would know roughly what part of the Apostles' Creed we were in. And then I decided, no, I should put the whole thing. And by putting in the whole thing, I left out a really important part. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. And then this is what I left out. Suffered under Pontius Pilate. There's a whole lot wrapped up in that. Particularly as Paul writes in Romans about being united with Christ and the ways in which God has chosen to unite himself with us. But I left out that really important part. And there are wonderful things about that horrible message that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Several hundred years after the fact, in about the 5th century, uh, one of the saints of the church, Rufinus, was writing about the creed and writing about this phrase. He suffered under Pontius Pilate and he said, this is a remarkable thing. Because among other things that the creed is doing, this summary of our faith, this sort of nutshell of what it is that we believe, uh, various ways of putting down what it is we believe in the different creeds. But Rufinus said, but it also gives us an actual date. This locates the creed in time, in history, because of Pontius Pilate. Because we know he was only in Jerusalem for 10 years. And right about in the very middle of his time in Jerusalem, from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36, was when Jesus came before him. After the Sanhedrin had put him on trial, and then they brought him before Pontius Pilate, early, early in the morning, before it was actually light, getting us ready for early, early in the morning on Easter Sunday. So something about our faith is not just abstract ideas. It's not just thinking about God and what God might be like But it is showing us that the good news, the gospel, is about a God who acts, who does things, and who acts in history, and who is continuing to act in history. One of the first things about suffering, and not the most important thing about the fact that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Because I think where we need to head here today is exactly where I ended the children's sermon, is that we need to know that this part of the creed tells us about a God who acts in history, but also acts in our lives to do things that we cannot do for ourselves. But that's not exactly where it starts. He first acts in history and in our lives in a way that shows that he is a God of love and a God who understands And in this case shows us that he stands with us when we're going through things that we may think we won't ever be able to make it through in our own sufferings. 
More than most things nowadays, this seems to be the big hang-up for people when they're not so sure about this God thing, certainly about this Jesus thing, but even God in general, this seems to be one of the great speed bumps, one of the great obstacles and stumbling blocks for people. The idea that there is suffering in this world, and what does that mean about God? Well, the short answer is, it's a mystery, and I can't solve it right now, but we can make some progress on it. There are lots of ways to look at suffering. Philosophers who tend only to suffer in small ways. Uh, They tend not to have a lot of money and maybe not have a lot to eat because they spend all their money on books. But philosophers have come up with a few solutions for suffering. One is that it's really not that big a deal. It feels bad, but it's not really that big a thing. This is a horrible paraphrase from somebody who's never studied philosophy. Um, Or there's the idea that it it, it does exist, but we're going to overcome it in some way because it's not really enough to sort of take us out of things. The really deep, heavy philosophers say there's actually not suffering in the world. It's not real. The Christian faith speaks to suffering in a very different way. It says suffering absolutely is real. And that God is active in the midst of suffering. And that God has not only seen suffering, but God has suffered himself in Jesus Christ. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. I've told you before, but on September 11th and the few days after that, one of the things that I was listening most for, and I wouldn't have thought of it necessarily, except that they kept interviewing people around New York City and around Ground Zero, and at least one line of questioning was always this, where was God on September 11th? I'm fascinated by the answer to that question. Where is God in the midst of suffering? And what I finally heard, not quite the way that I would like to have heard it, but I finally heard it, was God was not off doing something else. God was not up in his heaven sitting silently watching while these horrible things happened. God was not indifferent to what was happening. Neither was God powerless to act. See, that's where we get ourselves in trouble. And I'm happy to be in this kind of trouble. This is where I get into a corner a little bit because I want you to hold on to two things. You have to hold on to two things. One, I want you to hold on to the fact that God is love and God is loving. So that when his children, people made in his own image, suffer, God suffers too. But I don't want you to let go of the fact that God is all-powerful. And God acts in ways that show his great power. Because this is the problem with suffering. If God is loving, how could he let suffering happen? If God is all-powerful, why doesn't he stop it? So, if suffering happens, then it may be that we have a loving God. Maybe. But he's just not strong enough to stop it. Or suffering happens and God is strong enough to stop it. And just doesn't care enough about you or me to do anything about it. He suffered under Pontius Pilate so that he would know what it means for us to suffer. In Sunday school today, once again, tracking very nicely with the Apostles' Creed, we talked about sin coming into this world. What was the big deal about eating that one little fruit off that one little tree? Everything changed when they did. That's the big deal about eating that one little fruit from the one little tree that God said, any tree, any tree at all, just not that one. And sin comes into the world and it touches everything. Because it's not just people who need to be redeemed. Paul says that all creation is longing for its redemption. Why does creation need to be redeemed? What did creation do wrong? It didn't do anything wrong. It just had all this happen to it. Sin came into this world and it's like dropping a drop of ink into a big thing of water. It doesn't stay a little ball of ink. It goes everywhere and colors all of the water. Suffering has come into this world. Sin has come into this world. Brokenness has come into this world. And God is about the business of redeeming, of repairing, of transforming and renewing. But he doesn't just wait until the end to enter into it. But he wades right into the midst of suffering and says, I understand. Because I have suffered too. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. Two words that come along with suffering, although we've moved them into a place where they don't really seem to have much to do with it anymore. Sympathy and compassion. Sympathy, you think you feel sorry for somebody. That's not exactly that. And more importantly, you want to know where this word comes from. And it's originally two Greek words put together. But the sim of sympathy is a with word. And the pathy or pathos is a suffering word, among other things. Sympathy is to suffer along with somebody. To have feelings along with somebody, to have the same feelings as somebody, to understand them. So to sympathize doesn't just mean, oh, isn't that a shame? It really has more to do with what we often think of as empathy. I understand. And compassion. 
Well, we have compassion for people who are in trouble, people who are hurting. But that's also straight, not out of Greek this time, but out of Latin. The com of compassion is the other with word, and the passion is literally suffering. You don't think of that. What's your passion? Well, the original root of passion was suffering, not your enthusiasm or, or desire. Compassion is, again, to suffer along with somebody else. Jesus sympathizes with us on our weakness because he understands. And God has compassion on his children. And it doesn't just mean that he, he feels for us, he feels sorry for us, he lo- lo- loves us and longs for us in the midst of suffering. He suffers along with us. Compassion. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. The gospel is not just about ideas. It is about a person and a person acting in our lives, in history, and continuing to act. And he acts in ways that are astonishing. I read that a couple of times this week. Astonishing. This is the part of the creed that really should blow us away. First, the good news tells us that this way of acting that God acted in history had a great cost. Because what is Jesus doing? He suffered and was buried. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead and buried. Why did God come to this earth in order to be crucified? Because the good news is that God has acted to break sin's hold on us. Because we were enslaved to sin and death, and we don't have to know that to be the case for it to be true. Some people know it much better than others. Some people are very aware Once they were lost and now they were found. Once they were enslaved and now they are free. Once they were dead and now alive. True for all of us in Christ Jesus. Some of us had a little bit of a smoother road. And others of us, complete transformation. God has acted, this acting God. Doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And one of his acts is to break sin's hold on us and on this world. And that's great good news. But it's also a costly act. He suffered. He was crucified for us. Alistair McGrath is one of the writers that I read about the Apostles' Creed, the thin little book that I've shown you before and the book called I Believe. And he said that Christianity is not just about, it's not just about this historical fact that Christ died. And it's not just about the historical fact that Christ died for sins. It is about the astonishing and thrilling truth that he died in order that we might be forgiven. And what a death it was. That's what this passage from Isaiah that Diane read is all about. I don't know what the first hearers of Isaiah thought about, about this suffering servant, all these suffering servant songs uh, that Isaiah sings here. But we considered this one punished by God and stricken and afflicted, cursed by God. But he was pierced for our transgressions and was crushed for our iniquities. 700 years before Jesus is born, I don't know what people thought when they heard this, this man of suffering familiar with pain, but this is a God who suffers along with his people. But I will tell you that when Jesus goes through this life and he teaches and preaches and heals, and then he is crucified on the cross and then raised again from the dead, that the first believers, next time they were flipping through Isaiah, which you can't do, right? Because it's a scroll, but pretend that they could flip through Isaiah. They get to Isaiah and they go, this is what we've been waiting for. Isaiah knew this hundreds of years ago. He took our pain. He bore our suffering. That's what the cross was all about. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin and alive to righteousness. Oppressed and afflicted, but through that affliction, he brought us peace. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. It is costly, but it is God's acting in love and acting through suffering in order to bring us to life. It's an incredible thing. So we are justified by his blood. We who were once God's enemies reconciled by Christ's death, well then, now that Jesus is alive again and he died for us, how much more will we be saved? Reconciled, no longer separated. And I don't know what image you have about sin, whether it is uh, a taint, like I said, a, a drop of food coloring in a, in a big container of water, or whether it is more of a mud thing for you, something we have to wash off. I don't know whether you think of sin as something that keeps us from one another, a barrier in some way. Hey, are you over that wall? I can't hear you. Are you over there? I can't get to you because there's something between us. But... The sad fact of the matter is that the tiniest little sin, the sin that we wouldn't think twice about, wouldn't even register as sin on our radars, is enough to put an unbridgeable chasm between us and God and seriously damage every relationship we have with everybody else. 
The not good news, the sad news is that we continue in our lives to make distances and barriers between ourselves and between ourselves and God. But Jesus bridges that gap at the cost of his own blood. It's Reformation Sunday, so we're singing Reformation era hymns, and um, I've got a little handout that you can pick up on the way out if you want about uh, a pre-Reformation reformer. But one of the things that uh, John Calvin gets a bad rap for a lot of things, and he was a scholar, and he was a lawyer before he was a priest, and um, just like Luther was, and he's a wordy kind of guy, but people forget that he was also a preacher, not just a teacher, and he did write a lot. But he was talking about Jesus suffering, but also what comes out of this suffering in a way that is incredible, his use of language. Because he sets up this and then he brings it around. Uh, he talks about condemnation and then our condemnation. Um, and the judge's sentence and then the highest judge. So just listen to this, what he says about this part of the creed, but about Jesus suffering. Jesus suffered moreover under Pontius Pilate, condemned indeed by the judge's sentence as a criminal and wrongdoer, in order that we might by his condemnation, be absolved, be absolved before the judgment seat of the highest judge. Jesus condemned before this little judge Pilate so that we, before the judge of the universe, God himself, might be absolved, set free, declared not guilty. He was crucified that in the cross, which had been cursed by God's law, that's Deuteronomy, by that cursed cross, he might bear our curse, which our sins deserved. He died so that we would not have to. He bore our sins so that we would not have to. He bore our, he became a curse for us so that we would not be cursed by God. He died that by his death, he might conquer death. It's just incredible paradox. Jesus dies and in so doing conquers death forever and ever because he is raised again from the dead and death, which had the final say, all the power now is powerless. He died that by his death, he might conquer death, which was threatening us and might swallow it which was to have swallowed us. He was buried that through his grace, we might be buried to sin, freed from the sway of the devil and of death. And then of course, raised again so that we too might be raised with him. And that's really the the thrust of uh, chapter six in, uh, in Romans there. We are united with this one who suffers with us, who dies for us, who bears our sins for us. We are united with him so that we can be utterly changed. Don't you know, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. I think this is the last time I'm going to tell this story. Because it is biblically and theologically absolutely true and so horrifying that I don't think I can ever imagine ever doing this ever as a pastor. But it has to do with baptism. Don't you know if we were baptized with Jesus, we were baptized into his death and we were buried with him. So there is a pastor, maybe more than one, because it is biblically and theologically true and powerful and just so horrifying. I can't do it. But this is a pastor who will take this sweet little precious infant babe who has been presented by its parents to be baptized. And before baptizing this baby, declares this biblical and theological truth. This child is dead. And I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This child is now alive. Boy, that'll be the talk of the lunch with the grandparents uh, after the baptism. I tell you what, did you invite the pastor? Don't invite the pastor to the... Did you hear what he said about our precious little grandchild? Said child was dead. And then said he was alive. Yeah, he said he was alive, but at that point I'd lost him. I wasn't listening to him anymore because he said this terrible thing, which is absolutely true. Apart from Christ dead, lost. No hope whatsoever. In Christ alive and alive forever. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life raised with him as Jesus was raised so that we might live a new life. We might be new people, a new creature, a new creation in Jesus Christ. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. A couple more ideas about the resurrection that that come from one of these Apostle Creed books that I've been looking at. What does the resurrection tell us? What does it tell us about God? What does it tell us about Jesus? What does it tell us about ourselves? What does it tell us about God? Well, again, one of the issues out there in the world is, who is this God? You're going to church on Sunday? Who is this God that you're going to meet? Okay, I have to tell you, some of you may have seen a child on the floor in the narthex on your way into church this morning, and you may have think this was a child just throwing a temper tantrum. This was a child who was upset because he was having to leave and he wanted to see God and came in here looking for him. 
Well, that raises all kinds of theological problems, doesn't it? Including, if he had sat through this service, and he was looking around, if he had to pick somebody out to be God, who would he probably pick? Well, either Diane or me, I think, probably, because we're at the big fancy thing, right? And we're the ones talking. That would be a horrible mistake. But there's something very true about this longing to see God. And something about the way God works in us and in our lives and in our life together as a community ought to be, for that child and for anyone else, a way to see God. Who is this God? The God that we worship, the God that we adore, it's the one who raised Jesus from the dead. That's the God we worship. No other gods. There are other gods that have been in mythologies and uh, other religions and all, all sorts of things. Who is this God involved in the resurrection? Who is this God that we as Christians worship and adore, the one who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, what does the resurrection tell us about Jesus, this one who was raised? It tells us a few things. One, it declares that he is the unique son of God, the unique lamb of God who can take away sins. He can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It also, though, shows us that this God whom we worship and adore, who is God in Jesus Christ, is a God of love, a God of overwhelming, eternal, overpowering love. Jesus is in the garden, says to the Father, if there's another way. By that he doesn't mean, if there's another way for this plan to happen, if we can accomplish this strategy that we put together when we were putting the world together, If there's any other way, what he's getting at, is there any other way that these children of God, these people made in God's image can be saved? Let's do that. But if there's not, this is what we'll do. And this is what I'll do. Go to death on a cross. And in so doing, conquer sin and death and be raised again to new life, to the glory of God the Father. It tells us about the Son of God and of his great love. It also tells us about ourselves, though, as believers. If we are united with Christ, if we were united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his so that we might live a new life. What our Lord is, we shall be as well. Not my phrase, not my idea, but I love it. What Jesus is, we shall one day be as well. Early church father Irenaeus put it a different way. Jesus came down from heaven to earth so that he might take us back to heaven to be where he is. He became one of us so that we could become like him. He's still the unique son of God, but we are children of God because God came down to earth, lived this life, died in our place, rose again, ascended into heaven, and by the Holy Spirit makes us children of God if we believe in Jesus. So in a sense, we're already children of God, but he will also one day glorify us, bring us into the presence of almighty, eternal, holy God. What does this part of the creed tell us? He suffered, he was crucified, dead, and buried. He had ascended into hell, and I left that part out entirely, not on purpose. I remembered it in the first service. I'd be happy to have a lovely conversation with you at some point about what it means that he descended into hell. And I'll have some props, too, because I've got about... Oh, about eight pages of what John Calvin said about he descended into hell. This is just all he descended into hell, that part of the creed. We can talk about that. Suffered what we should have suffered so that we do not have to, died so that we can live, paid for our sins so that a price we could not pay was taken care of. But it also means that we are to live a new life. And that just doesn't just mean one day in eternity we'll be with God. It means right now we should be so transformed by this God who suffered for us, who died for us, who was raised again for us, that we might live a new life here and now. So that not just a little boy who's looking for God and thinks this is the right place to look, and he's pretty close to right about that. But so that the whole world can see that we are new creatures, new people, children of God, living in this world, able not only to live out, but also to proclaim good news about a God of love, of saving love, a God who suffers with the suffering, and a God who saves those who are lost. Will you please join me in prayer? O Lord, our God, by your power, continue your transforming, redeeming work within us, making us into the people you want us to be. Unite us with Christ so that we might not only be united with him in his death and burial, but also in his glorious resurrection. Convince us once again that sin and death have no power over us, certainly not the final say. For you have given us life, and you call us to live a new life, a life lived for you. A life lived as your children. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.